test. Test.
Good evening. I welcome you tonight on this Monday Thursday. And I have had people say, Monday, what is that? And it's the word for Latin for the mandate, the night in which Jesus was with his friends around that table. And he said, this is my commandment that you love one another and that we are to live in that love and extend that love to others. So I welcome you tonight as we gather together and worship. Uh, highlight a few things. Um, it is Holy Week and the church will be open tomorrow on Good Friday from noon until seven. And then also on Saturday from 8 until 2 in the afternoon for prayer in the sanctuary. There will be different prayer stations in there. There will be prompts that will be here to help guide you in prayer and reflection and invite you just to make prayer a part of this holy weekend. And then on Sunday morning, 6.15 down at the docks, we will have our sunrise service and invite you to be with us there or at 10 o'clock here in um, the sanctuary. And we welcome those who are joining us on Facebook and we'll have that live on Sunday morning at 10 as well. want to let you know that for our offering tonight, we invite you to share after the service as we go out. Um, we have our offering buckets there at the back door and invite you to share in an offering that way. But I invite you just to prepare your hearts as we enter into this time where we are reminded of God's wondrous love for us that's demonstrated through God's Son, Jesus and on the cross. And we share in communion tonight and all are welcome to share in that. And those that are at home, we invite you to get some crackers and juice or some bread or water to join us at that time. So throughout Lent, we've been on this journey here in Weartown of the dark woods of our lives. The dark woods are those times where there's uncertainty, emptiness, lostness, temptations, things that keep us from being fully who God has created us to be, things that come into our lives. And in those moments, though, we often think that God is not there. We often think that they're not something that's a gift to us, but they really are, and God has been there. And so no one is immune from these aspects of life, even Jesus. In fact, the story of Jesus's final days in his human life is a story of a journey through the dark night of his soul for all of those, and for all those who were surrounding him, his friends and loved ones. So the story this evening that we hear is one that we've heard before, one of love, also one of unmet expectations, one of despair, one of heartache and betrayal. These are feelings we don't enjoy hearing about or even ourselves feeling them and going through them. But in this dark and in this holy Thursday night and as we enter into Good Friday, we turn to that pain. We turn to that heartache and we focus on the gifts that even in the midst of them, we can find God and that we can experience life in that. So as we journey with Jesus these final days of his life, may we also look inward and reflect so that we can be transformed more into what God has called us to be and to love us and to know that love again tonight. And so will you stand and will you join in the prayer that's on the screen? Unfortunately, we don't have our bulletin today because of all the times it the copier machine decided not to work. <laughs> and ensued a panic call to the, uh, the copier company. And so we're going to use our PowerPoint today and invite you to sh share in the prayer together. Unexpected love, Holy Spirit guide, open us to the story of pain and sacrificial love anew. Help us to walk with each other as Jesus walks with us. As we remember these last days of Jesus' earthly life, help us to look deeply at our own lives and allow his journey to move us into deeper love and service. Amen. 
Remain standing as we sing the first verse of What Wondrous Love Is This. The words are there on the screen. If you like your hymnal, it is page 292 in the red hymnal. It's verse 1. But let us sing What Wondrous Love Is This. of Jesus in the last days of his life. And so tonight we hear the eyewitnesses of Mary, who was a friend of Jesus, Simon Peter, the disciple of Jesus, Judas, disciple and betrayer of Jesus, a Roman soldier, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Salome. Sometimes, as we said earlier, this story feels only like a story to us. We've heard it so many times, but it is a real story. It is a rich story. It's life-changing. It's painful. And for generations and generations, we as Christians have gathered together to hear this story shared so that we who live and love Jesus, we can be reminded of the gratefulness of what Jesus did for us. So as we hear the story shared from the perspective of people who walked the journey with Jesus, may their voices call us more deeply into our faith story and our love for God. From John chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Judas objected, why was this money not used to feed the poor? Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. I was in the middle of the marketplace that day and it hit me like an overwhelming wave of feeling. I loved him so much. It was a love beyond anything I'd ever known. Not romantic, not like a sibling, certainly like family, but he was so much more to me. He was a teacher, he was priest, he was wise one, he was hope itself. And for the first time in those days before the terrible thing happened, I felt he might not be invincible. He had told us, he had warned us, he had been saying this could happen all along, but I just couldn't imagine it. He was so vibrant, it seemed, like nothing, not even God would dare to take him away from any of us. But the tension was building. 
I will beg him, I thought, to not go to Jerusalem, just go back to Galilee, go to the hills, go to Nazareth, go anywhere but Jerusalem right now. But even as I thought it to myself, I knew that he wouldn't leave. This is where he was supposed to be. With all these people gathered for Passover, Jerusalem is where he had to be. And I knew he might never leave. I suddenly became aware that I could not move, oblivious to all around me here in this marketplace, and I began to double over with fear. But just as I did, my eyes came to rest to the stall to my right, a jar, a most beautiful jar of anointing oil. The seller offered it up to me for a price that seemed outrageous, and I didn't care. No price could compare with the price my teacher, my master, would pay. And so I bought it. Whether in life or in death, my beloved friend would need it. Mary's anointing of Jesus belonged to the tradition of honoring someone with a sweet-smelling oil made of a combination of herbs and essence. This was used at the consecration of kings and also for the anointing for burial. And in this one act that Mary did of anointing Jesus' feet, she offers signs of love and honor. The early Christians used the same scented oil as part of their baptismal and confirmation rite to emphasize their new identity in Christ. And Christ's word in the Greek means anointed one. And so tonight, inspired and following in the act of Mary's act of anointing, we will anoint you tonight if you want to be anointed when we come up for communion. In our time of communion, we'll have a station for communion and a station for anointing. And in this time, as you are anointed, we are reminded that we are God's beloved child and that God fills us with love and that oil covers us. And so with that in mind, let us sing what wondrous love verse 2 as a reminder of that love. When they had finished supper, Jesus got up from his table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? After he had washed their feet and returned to the after he washed his feet and returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done for you? Learn from me. You call me teacher, Lord. If I have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. He, continue, he continually baffled me. The whole time I was with him, one surprise after another, Jesus turned my whole world upside down, especially when it came to relationships. We would worry about who the, his right-hand man would be, 
and how he would be and how it would be. But then he would always come back with the last shall be first stories. And I wanted to know where I stood with him. I needed to know that he knew that he was my Lord, my master, my teacher. And he was. But then he did this that night. Now, none of us were of high lineage, but we were not slaves or servants. I mean, at the meal that night, there were people who were waiting on us. This service came just like anyone who had rented a room for a meal. But I had planned to wash his feet that night. I was overwhelmed with love for him, and I was in fear of his life. I had this nagging need to show him, to demonstrate to him that I would do anything for him. But before I could even begin, he knelt down before me and he insisted on washing my feet. I was horrified. I thought he had lost his mind. One more time he reversed the way I thought things were ought to have been done. But he said to me, you cannot be a part of my family, the family of God, the kingdom of God, Peter, if you don't let me do this. As if he had already meant, and if he had really meant what he said about serving our neighbors, our friends, and our enemies. And he always really kept me off balance. I thought he, I knew what he meant, but I guess I really had to surrender all my preconceived ideas about how relationships are and how they go and who we love. I had to surrender and let go in the loving act of him washing my feet. He also healed my soul and healed every disappointing relationship that I had ever encountered. So Jesus' act of washing the feet of his disciples was to model for us the kind of love that we are to demonstrate and to have for one another. It is one that seeks to serve. The scripture said that Jesus came not to be served unto, but to serve others. And so today... We are going to sing this song, the servant's song. These words are there on the screen, Karen. We'll play through it one time for us so we hear the melody, and then we will sing through it with, with all of us.
So in our world today, we don't go around washing feet. People would look at us a little with their eyebrow raised. But we do, in our world, wash our hands. And in fact, in the last couple of years, washing your hands has taken on a whole new meaning. It's cleanliness, but it also, for some, it's the difference of life and death as different things can be transferred, as we, we learned um, over the last three years. But the simple act of hand washing is one in which we can be reminded of the sacrifice sacrificial love of God, and the symbol of love, and the symbol of service. So I suspect this weekend, if any of you are going to have an Easter dinner, if any of you are going to have a meal, that you will probably be near a sink. And when you are in the act of washing your hands, I invite you to take a moment just to stop and remember the gift of servanthood. And to take a moment as that water runs over, as you use soap, to just think of who you can serve and give thanks to God for that servant love that's been given to us. And look for a way to share that. We continue through the evening of which Jesus was with his friends. Jesus was troubled in spirit that night, and he said, I'm telling you, one of you is going to betray me. The disciples looked at each other, not sure who or what he was talking about. Peter leaned over to Jesus and said, Lord, who is it? Jesus turned to Judas and gave him his own piece of bread. Go quickly, Jesus said to him. Do what you must do. I was so angry with him. Why wouldn't he fight? He had so many followers by this time, and there were so many of them in Jerusalem right now. Why did he insist on this blessed are the meek stuff? I think all along I had hoped that this was the revolution that we would finally stand up to that Roman emperor, emperor occupiers. And he had such power and charisma. Couldn't he have done anything, the son of God? I suppose my bitterness finally took over. I kept it all inside for some time and it had started to boil and rage until I just snapped. If I couldn't get my revolution, I could get out. I was tired of holding the purse of, of this motley group of people who gave it away as soon as the money came in. And then I discovered I could get out with some money from those horrible self-righteous religious people who hated Jesus. It all happened so fast. They approached me. They had seen me, watched me, perhaps read my indecision, my anger, my separation at times from the group, and it just happened. And then there I was at the table, Jesus' table, knowing what I had set into motion. All of a sudden, I was flooded with panic as all were sitting there. The air felt heavy with fear and unknowing at the table again. It reminded me of all the meals that we'd had over the years together. Sometimes just us, the small band of disciples, but often with someone that Jesus had invited to join us for dinner. Someone we couldn't believe yet again that he was hanging out with. Sometimes it was hard to understand. People who took advantage of others, people who had no interest in supporting Jesus, people who questioned him, people who were beneath him. Really, he invited anyone to the table, the bottom feeders. Then I realized 
as he stretched out the cup of wine to me and he dipped the bread in it, that he saw right through me. He knew my thoughts. He was doing it once again, inviting a scoundrel to dinner. Only this time, it was me. He was offering to share the cup and to break the bread with despicable me. He would never have hurt anyone. He loved us all, even the lowest of the low. Friends, just as Jesus did not hesitate to share the cup of wine with Judas, who he knew would betray him to the authority, Jesus invites all of us to this table. And this is a table that is set for all people. It's a table that is Christ's table. All are welcome at the table. You need not be a member of this church. You need not be a member of any church. You're here tonight, and this is a table that says, come and join with me. So we're going to sing this song, Come to the Table of Grace. We'll hear it through played, and then we'll sing two verses of it, Come to the Table of Grace. Will you stand as we sing this? of love. be seated. So Jesus says, come and eat with me for this grace can transform you. And so this night we are invited to come just like it was at that last supper, to share the food that nourishes our spirits on the journey and to hear and remember the words that Jesus said that night to his disciples. And the words that have been echoed throughout the ages. And may we be reminded that as we're at this table that Jesus is there with us and says, I am always with you. And so as we come to this table, I invite you to take a moment of silent reflection. Invite those who are going to be serving with us to join us here up in the front and have a seat. And then uh, invite you just to have silent reflection now in prayer before the Lord of Confession. God, you hear our hearts. And tonight we remember that your love is poured out to us and that we are forgiven. So we hear and receive the good news that God has forgiven us. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
My friends, let us share in the great thanksgiving of the, the table. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And in the midst of the events of the last week, the disciples had really floundered. They didn't know where they were or what was happening. Yes, it started out fine, and there was great excitement as they entered into Jerusalem. And they entered in with the crowd saying these words, and we say them again tonight. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. But that excitement that week turned into doubt. It turned into questions, confusion, fear, even betrayal. Jesus was the one who proclaimed the message that they could all believe in the disciples' thought. And then it came to this, that they would hear the words that Jesus came to proclaim freedom for those who were captive, recover sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and announce that the time had come when Jesus would save his people. And they knew that he had fulfilled the scriptures. And then Jesus said at that moment these words to them. He said, on the night in which he gave himself up for us, the message of life, of peace, of hope and justice, that night he gave himself up, he took the bread and he lifted it. He gave thanks to you, O oh God, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. And for the first time, these next words that we hear were spoken. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup that was there, on the table when the supper was over. He gave thanks to God and he gave it to his disciples and he said, drink of this cup. This is the cup of the new covenant, a cup of new life for the forgiveness of sins for you and for many. And then he said those words, do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. So tonight we eat and drink of this meal together, especially remembering the death of Jesus. But we also know the rest of the story, even though the disciples didn't know it at that time. We know that from death emerges life. And so today we can proclaim the words that we have said before. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here tonight, just as you did on that night so long ago when Jesus was there with his disciples. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine and let them be for us the body and blood of Christ so that we may be the body of Christ, the hands and feet of Christ to this suffering world. God, help us to die to the ways of this world, to the ways in which bring in justice, to the ways in which there is not peace, to the ways in which there is not love. But God, inspire us and renew us tonight to proclaim your love, your hope, your peace in this world. And, oh God, by your spirit, bring all of us together tonight, one with Christ, whose presence was real with the disciples and whose presence is here with us now. We thank you that by your spirit we are one with each other and may people see us and know that this love that's from you brings us together and it's a love that can bring us together in this world. And so we give thanks. God, for this time at the table, 
and we say amen, and we share in the prayer that Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to invite those who are helping to serve and also with anointing to come. We're going to come to the table, and there will be one station here for your communion, so you'll come down the aisle, and then you'll go out this way, and there will be two stations for anointing if you want to be anointed with oil. But the table has been set. I invite you to come to the table.
After dinner, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus prayed. And then the soldiers came. They arrested Jesus. They took him to the council, to the governor's palace, where they tried to make it look like a trial, but it wasn't. And then finally, they led him away to the place where criminals were hung, always on a cross so that they would die slowly, painfully. Jesus was hung in between two other crosses, bandits on each side. And the sign over Jesus' cross said, this was the king of the Jews. I'm a Roman centurion. The scene was horrifying. Not that I wanted crucifixions. They were the favored way of putting prisoners to death by the Romans, so I'd assisted many times. But I'd heard about this man, Jesus. We thought Barabbas was going to be on this cross, but the crowds had become almost out of control, and I heard that Pilate simply washed his hands of it sent this one to die just to shut them up. Who knows what these crowds really were screaming about. There was so much confusion and rumor. No one will probably ever know the truth. That's what I think. But when the reality hit his followers that Jesus was really going to die, and they saw him heading to Golgotha with the cross, the horror really began. Even the heavens seemed to be wailing as storms began to appear. It gave me a chill. I'm going to tell you, these are not things I want to tell you. I'm a soldier, but it's always easier protecting others than protecting yourself. From the mothers who beg for the mercy for their sons, from those who insist on waiting the hours and even days it takes to die this agonizing death. Being a soldier can't always protect you from what the witness what you witness firsthand. Like hearing Jesus talk to the prisoners on the other two crosses next to him. The promise that death is not the end for them. And then he looked at me. He looked right at me. And he spoke the words that I'll hear for the rest of my life. And the words that mean I can no longer do this job anymore. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Later, after he died, they pierced him in his side. I still don't understand why, but in that moment, I knew that he was truly the son of God. His blood poured out, just like the love he poured out to the people. The blood flowed from his side. The blood flowed. The love flowed.
let us all sing. Standing near the cross of Jesus, where his mother, standing, acro standing near the cross of Jesus, where his mother and some other women he had known well, when he saw his mother and the disciple John there in front of him, Jesus said, take this son in my place, take good care of my mother. My son, from the moment the angel said to me, you will bear a son, my life was no longer my own. And yet, it is every bit mine. Moments treasured, remembered in my heart alone. Every moment he grew within me, every day of his youth, every movement of his ministry from that day in Cana to very, this very minute. At times, the pain of watching him give his life away seemed harder to bear than the wonder of this unimaginable life God had given me. And especially now, in this moment, I am not just the mother of Jesus shedding tears for my son. I am the tears of any mother who has seen their child die before them. I am the tears of every mother who has lost children in war and in injustice. I am the tears of all the loved ones who cannot save their loved ones as they starve or are taken by illness or injury or who swept away in a tsunami or a flood. I know the tears of mothers whose children lose their lives to addiction or are consumed by depression or are lost to violence. And I am the tears of all those who do not know the fate of the missing ones. I and the tears. The tears of a mother because of her son Jesus, the Lamb of God that was slain for us. So let us sing in a very solemn way, the Lamb of God.
Mark's gospel mentions our last character at the scene of the cross. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and, Sol and Salome. Salome later accompanies the women to the tomb. They're at the cross, and they lead us tonight to the cross. And so as we leave this place tonight, we leave at the foot of the cross. We are praying for those and for ourselves as we remember what the cross means for us. We continue to stay at the cross this weekend as there will be prayer stations here. May we, even in our hearts throughout the weekend, envision that we are there at the cross. So I invite you to stand, and you will need your hymnals. We're going to turn to page 297 and sing Beneath the Cross, page 297. <laughs> Bye. 
We sang, I take, O cross, thy shadow for my abiding place. May we abide at the foot of the cross. Go in peace. Amen. Let us go in silence. Mm -hmm. 